In our previous lesson, we studied how to find a consumer's demand for a good by finding the quantity that the consumer likes best, given prices of goods, preferences, and income. We call this quantity the consumer's demand for the good. Today, we will explore the demand function in more detail to see what we can learn from it about consumer behavior. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to analyze the effects of changes in prices and income on a consumer's optimal choices and determine whether the predicted effects of changes in prices or income on a consumer's optimal choice make sense. In our previous unit, we studied three types of consumer choice models. We studied a consumer's choice when goods are perfect complements, in which we found that the consumer's choice will always be where the budget line touches the corner of an indifference curve. We studied the case of perfect substitutes, in which the consumer's optimal choice is at the top of the indifference curve if the indifference curve is flatter than the budget line. at the bottom of the indifference curve if the indifference curve is steeper than the budget line, or any point on the indifference curve if the budget line and the indifference curve have the same slope. Finally, we studied models with standard or Cobb-Douglas preferences, where the optimal choice is at a tangency point between the indifference curve and the budget line. For each of these choice environments, we can write the solution to the consumer's choice problem as a function. This function describes the consumer's optimal quantity of a good as a function of market prices and income. This function is called the demand function and is written as xi as a function of income, the price of good 1, and the price of good 2. You can use this function to find the consumer's optimal quantity of a good to consume for any possible values of prices and income. You can also use the function to analyze how the consumer's choice will change as market conditions, particularly prices and income, change. This type of analysis is called comparative statics. Let's consider a few examples now. For our first example, we will consider goods that are perfect one-to-one -one complements. By now, you should know that the formula for the utility function that represents these preferences is u of x1 and x2 equals the minimum of x1 and x2. And of course, the formula for a generic budget constraint is p1 times x1 plus p2 times x2 equals income. You should also know that the indifference curves for these preferences are shaped like L's with the corners along a 45 degree line from the origin and that the consumer's optimal bundle will be where the corner of the indifference curve is just touching the budget line. From previous examples, we know that the consumer's optimal consumption of good one is income divided by the sum of prices. The consumer's optimal consumption of good two is the same. Note that these formulas allow us to find the amounts of goods one and two that the consumer will buy for any combination of prices and income. Now that we have the demand functions, we can begin to analyze how demand for a good changes as prices and income change. This analysis is called comparative statics. When we do comparative static analysis, we examine how a consumer's behavior changes in response to a change in one variable while holding the other variables constant. There are three types of changes we can analyze how demand for a good changes when income changes, holding prices constant, how demand for a good changes when its own price changes, holding other prices and income constant, and how demand for a good changes when the price of another good changes, holding all other prices and income constant. Let's start our comparative static analysis with an analysis of how demand for goods that are perfect one-to-one -one complements changes as income changes. From a simple examination of the functions, we can see that as income increases, the amount of goods 1 and 2 that the consumer will buy will also increase, since income is in the numerator of both demand functions. The other way that we can determine how the optimal quantities of goods 1 and 2 change as income changes is to take the partial derivative of the demand functions with respect to income. 
Since the partial derivatives are always positive, we say that goods 1 and 2 are normal goods. The other way that we can analyze the relationship between the quantity of a good demanded and income is to graph it. If we graph the relationship between either x1 or x2 and income, the result will be a straight line through the origin with a slope of 1 over p1 plus p2. However, the convention in economics is to reverse the axes so that income is on the vertical axis and quantity is on the horizontal axis. The graph of the relationship will still be a straight line, but the slope will equal p1 plus p2 instead of 1 over p1 plus p2. When the relationship between quantity demanded and income is depicted in this way, the graph is called an angle curve. Because this angle curve is upward sloping, we know that goods 1 and 2 are normal goods. A good whose demand falls as income increases is called an inferior good. What inferior goods can you think of? In addition to analyzing the effect of income on quantity demanded, we can analyze the effect of prices. To analyze the effect of a good's own price on quantity demanded, take the partial derivative of the demand function with respect to price. Since this fraction is unambiguously negative, we know that quantity demanded falls as the price increases, which is consistent with what we learned in introductory economics about the law of demand. Alternatively, we can simply graph the demand function in x1, p1 space. If we hold income and the price of good 2 constant, the graph of x1 versus p1 simply looks like the inverse function. This has the typical downward sloping shape that we expect of a demand function. In the previous slide, we graphed the demand function with the quantity of good 1 on the vertical axis and the price of good 1 on the horizontal axis. This follows the standard mathematical convention of putting the dependent variable on the vertical axis and the independent variable on the horizontal axis. Note that in this case price is indeed independent, as in our model a consumer is not able to choose the price that he or she pays for a good. When we graph demand in this way, the figure is called a demand curve. Frequently, when we do market analyses, we flip the axes so that price is on the vertical axis and quantity is on the horizontal axis. When we graph demand in this way, the curve is called an inverse demand curve. One way to interpret this curve is that the curve tells you the most that a consumer is willing to pay for a given quantity of good one. At this point, it may be useful to emphasize an important difference in terminology. We have used two terms to describe a consumer's demand for a good, demand function and demand curve. Although these phrases may sound similar, they are not interchangeable. The demand function is a complete description of the mathematical relationship between the amount of a good that a consumer chooses to buy and all the variables that affect the consumer's choice. In our simple two-good model, those variables are limited to income, the own price of the good, and the price of one other good. However, in more complex models, we are not limited to these three variables. We could include the prices of more than one alternative good, as well as other things like a consumer's demographics or characteristics of the good. In fact, in real-world market research studies of consumer choices, all of these factors and more are typically considered when modeling the demand function. By contrast, the demand curve is always interpreted to mean the graphical representation of the functional relationship between the quantity of a good a consumer purchases and the price of that same good. When representing this relationship, all other variables in the demand function are held constant. The last bit of comparative static analysis we can conduct is to examine the effect of other prices on a consumer's demand. To do this, take the partial derivative of the demand function for good 1 with respect to the price of good 2. When you do this, you see that the resulting expression is unambiguously negative. Because the demand for good 1 falls when the price of good 2 increases, we know that goods 1 and 2 must be complements. Now that we've worked through one example of comparative static analysis of a demand function, let's work through a couple of other examples more quickly. 
if goods are perfect one-to-one -one substitutes, then the indifference curves are straight lines with a slope of negative 1, and the formula for the utility function is u of x and y equals x plus y. For this example, we will derive and analyze the demand for good 1. There are three cases that we need to consider. The first case is the case um, when the price of good 1 is greater than the price of good 2. If that is the case, then the budget line will be steeper than the indifference curves, and the consumer will spend all of her money on good 2. Thus, the demand for good 1 in this case is 0. The second case is the case where the prices of goods 1 and 2 are equal. In this case, the slope of the budget line and the slope of the indifference curves are the same, and the consumer can choose any quantity of good 1 from none at all to spending all of her income on good 1. The third case is when the price of good 1 is less than the price of good 2. In this case, the budget line is flatter than the indifference curves, and the consumer will spend all of her money on good 1. Thus, she purchases M over P1 units of good 1 in this case. Now that we have derived the demand function for the case of perfect one-to-one -one substitutes, we could conduct some comparative static analysis. Note that because this demand function has several segments to it, it's easier to just think about what happens to the demand for good one as each variable changes, rather than to take derivatives of the demand function. Let's start off by assuming that the consumer is spending all of her income on good one. Remember that as we change each determinant of demand, we are holding the other determinants constant. First, if income increases, then the consumer will buy more of good one, so we know that good one is a normal good. Next, if we increase the price of good one, then the quantity of good one consumed will fall. This is the normal effect that we would expect based on the law of demand. However, in this case, if the price of good one increases by enough, the consumer will stop consuming good one completely and switch to good two. If the price of good 2 increases, since good 2 is already more expensive than good 1, the consumer will not change her behavior. However, if we start the consumer off as, at the opposite end of the demand curve, then at some point the price of good 2 will increase by enough that the consumer will switch to good 1. Note that because increases in the price of good 2 cause demand for good 1 to increase, we know that goods 1 and 2 are substitutes. Let's consider one more case, that of Cobb-Douglas preferences. One utility function that is consistent with these types of preferences is u of x and y equals x times y. In an example in an earlier lesson, we found that the solution for the optimal quantity of x was income divided by 2 times the price of x. Graphically, the optimal consumption point is located at a tangency point between the indifference curve and the budget line. To con conduct the comparative static analysis, we can analyze the signs of the partial derivatives of the demand function. Because the demand for good x increases as income increases, x is a normal good. The effect of increases on the price of good x on demand for good x is negative as expected. Finally, there does not appear to be an effect of the change in the price of good y on demand for good x. Does this mean that changes in the price of good y do not affect how much of good x the consumer buys? The answer in short is no. It just means that there is no direct effect. Changes in the price of good y still affect the demand for good x, but indirectly, through the effect on the buying power of the consumer's income. You will learn how to quantify these indirect effects in a later lesson. This concludes our lesson on deriving and analyzing consumer demand functions. You should be prepared to apply these concepts to real-world examples in class.